the director of operations had presented something that people made some good comments on to me. Not being here, not knowing exactly what it is, uh, Mr. Ted McCarty, of course, came with us on April 1st from Beatrice Foods with a background in dairy, dairying, milking the cows, you know, uh, to going into managing a dairy plant, to taking time out to go to school and become an attorney, to going with Beatrice Foods, to work with the federal orders and counseling for a major corporation. And there's a terrific background in this man that we all know that we need. Ted has helped us a great deal in the short time that he's been here, the knowledge that we've needed. So this time I'd like to call on Ted McCarty to present to you a few of the words that he had that I heard were great. I really don't know what the great words were. Uh, during this past week, we've said so many of them. Uh, many of you have probably been to prior meetings we've held, uh, starting with Wisconsin Rapids. You know, I can get enthused and carried away. I'm going to try to hold it down today because of our distinguished guests. We want to give them ample time. They've traveled a long way. Uh, to be with you, but so therefore uh, we're going to take it uh, smaller today than I normally do. One of the key points, and as Ed told you and as all of you recognize, I've been with this organization only a short time. I joined this organization because I believed in your philosophy. I still do, very strongly. Matter of fact, the longer I'm with it, the more I believe in it. When I was on the other side of the fence for 10 years, it took me a long time to understand why this bunch of idiots, NFO members, would stay with a rinky-dink organization and sell their milk for a dollar a hundred weight less than their neighbors were. Today, that's not the case. And it's one of the main reasons that I was impressed with this organization, because of the loyalty that you people have to a cause. And that cause is collective bargaining, not building plants, not going into the processing business, but staying with what we know and what we can do the best job of. As I've looked at this dairy industry, and I've been in many facets of it, uh, the organization refers to us as professionals. We are no more professionals than you are. I look upon this dairy industry as three separate and distinct segments. All professionals. You people sitting here are professionals in the dairy business, in producing milk, in feeding cows. You're efficient. You know your job, and you do it well. Hopefully, Doc Stewart, myself, others on our dairy staff, and I feel I have a fantastic staff. We're in the marketing of milk. You're a milk for you. And that's our job. Now, I've run processing plants. I don't profess to be an expert in it. Doc Stewart has operated processing plants. We could do it. But we chose this segment of the dairy industry to devote our time and efforts to. I strongly believe that the processing end is another distinct entity, separate and apart from producing milk and from marketing milk.
Now, in the last few months, and it took me that long to find the restroom in Corning almost. It's such a mass down there. And anybody who hasn't been there, I sincerely invite to come down and see our operation because it's impressive. But the longer I stay here, the more I get to know this organization and the people, and the stronger I feel about it. And I am convinced, as I told you earlier, that our cause, and I say our cause, is the right way to go. It bothered me for a long time, and I think we have to realize there's a difference between the National Farmers Organization and cooperatives. And I chose this philosophy of the National Farmers Organization because I believe in it. The difference is that I can see how can you sit on both sides of the bargaining table? How can you wear two hats at the same time? When you go in with a handler, or when we go in, to negotiate a price for milk, to negotiate a contract, we know where to sit because we're representing farmers. That's our only interest. But where does your co-op man sit? Which side of the table when he goes into bargain? Does he bargain for producers and sit on that side? And then all of a sudden run around to the other side and protect his interest as a handler? I don't feel it can be done. They're in conflict with one another. Now, I've gotten some feeling in the last couple of months that since we've gotten people who are have expertise in marketing, that many of our members, and we, I feel we were starting to fall into the same pitfall, and that is being another cooperative. That we are not. And until we, all of us, get back to the basic principles that this organization was founded under, we're not going to be anything but a third-rate co-op. And that's not our goals. That will not accomplish what we've set out to accomplish. I was in a meeting in northwest Iowa about four weeks ago. Matter of fact, the last two meetings I've been to, one in Wisconsin and one in northwest Iowa, in which we invited dairy farmers to come in and listen to us, small meetings, both those meetings, I've had directors uninvited of the major co-op in that area sitting in on my meetings. One, Ed Graff was there, I didn't even know the guy. So that one surprised me. I learned my lesson there, and I check everybody that comes into small meetings from now on. Not that I'm afraid of them, and I welcome them, because I will debate with them. We don't get mad, we debate, because I believe in our principles, and I'm firmly convinced that I can sell them to anybody. I don't care if it's a director of AMPI, a director of MIDAM, or who it is. And they were there to pick on us. There's no question about it. And one of the questions that one of these directors posed to me is, why are you guys fooling around in northwest Iowa? We've had this market for years. And we need another agricultural association in northwest Iowa like we need a hole in the head. And my answer to him was, the reason we're here is we're firmly convinced that you have not done and you are not doing your job. That's why we're here. 
because we definitely feel a job needs to be done for the dairy farmer. You guys have sat here for years with 75 and 80 percent of the total production and have not been able to get cost of production. All we're asking for is 30 percent or even 20 and we'll get the job done. That's why we're here and that's why we're going to stay here because the co-ops have not done the job of getting the price that dairy farmers need. And I want all of us to go away from this convention being proud that you are a part of the National Farmers Organization, that you have a cause, and that cause is right, and you should believe in it. And we've published in our brochure, and it's not by accident, we try to draw some comics, a funny cow and a gal with a milk bucket and all this stuff to make it light. But we put one thing on there which was bothering us. And as I talk to members, it appears to be bothering them. And that is, it's not a nickel, it's not a dime, it's cost of production, and now is the time. Now, in the short time I've been with this organization, I have seen prices to members of the National Farmers Organization increase. We're going to continue to do that through efficiencies on marketing, through more competent staff people. I've got practically no one left in Corning on my staff. Doc, I, and two others is about my entire national staff now. It's the entire national staff of this organization. Go look at the staff of some of the other agricultural groups. You'll see billions of people. Not in Corning, Iowa, to run this program. Because I am attempting to carry through which I, my staff, and the members I've talked to believe are right. And that's the philosophy that I carried over from a corporation I worked for before. And that is decentralized management. We don't need a big home office staff. I've got area directors throughout this United States with full responsibility. I don't call their shots. We'll have brainstorms, because hell, we don't have that many brains. We need brainstorms. We need a lot of them. And we'll bounce it around with one another just for ideas. But the final decision rests with that director of operations in the area. Because he's there every day. He understands the problems. He knows the market. He knows the people. He knows, knows, knows the roads. I can look at a map. I don't know. And I cannot call the shots from Corning, Iowa, or anywhere else on a national program. All we're doing is giving some direction and some assistance with questions and problems they may have. But we're going to a strong, decentralized operation. And if the director of operations in the area can't do the job, then I'll get somebody in there who can. But he's going to do it. He's got the responsibility. He can't shrug it. So. To summarize, I want to say that it's bothered me greatly that I think we're acting like a co-op. We've gotten meek and mild. We've forgotten a lot of the principles upon which this organization was founded. And it's time now, right now, to get back to those basics. When I came into this organization, I chastised this organization for things I felt were silly, stupid, 
shooting calves, dumping milk. But I commented that I realized that at the time there was a need and a purpose for it. That was to gain recognition. Today we've gained that recognition. But I'm telling you today, I don't care what it takes, I don't care if it's right or wrong, we'll make mistakes, but do something. And we haven't done anything in the last six months. I don't mean to criticize, because I've become one of you. I am personally involved in this organization, even though I've not been here that long. And all my heart and soul is in this organization. I will devote every bit of time and energy I have to promoting this cause. But we can't do it all. Now, you people can go out in the field with renewed vigor. You have nothing to be ashamed of. This organization has done a fantastic job for the dairy industry, and we're going to continue to do it. And we're going to lead the way in marketing milk in this United States. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, what Ted told you was uh, quite true, and I was interested in Ted's attitude and what he has uh, displayed to me when he came, because he said some time ago, I wouldn't have thought of coming with the National Farmers Organization. I think he's indoctrinated a little bit now, and he wants some fight back in this organization. And it takes production for him to handle, to put that strength and fight back in. Dr. Stewart talked with me a few minutes before we came over here. Dr. Stewart came with us about a little over a year ago. His background, of course, has been, he was a professor at Ames University, along with dealing and working for many of the national companies, traveling abroad, and understanding the other side of the fence, too. And it was his job to develop and open up markets. I'm sure in the meetings before he showed you lists of markets available. Uh, markets that are calling for much more milk. The thing that we need in collective bargaining, volume. And just before we came over here, he said, there's one thing that perhaps I've failed to touch on, and that's the future markets the future that he sees in the markets. And Dr. Stewart said he'd like to talk for just about 10 minutes on the future markets that he sees. Dr. Stewart. Thank you, Ed. Ladies, gentlemen, fellow members. Uh, last year at the Omaha Convention, I presented a list of markets that we had developed uh, as a part of collecting, collective bargaining with handlers and with about this long. This year I presented two or three meetings this uh, week. Most of you I'm sure have seen it and the uh, list is now uh, four pages this long. We've grown tremendously in establishment of new markets uh, many of you have asked for a list of these to help you in uh, obtaining new members and to put additional milk on. The reason uh, for them to put milk on because of the type of markets that we've had. I'm not going to put these on again because most of you have seen it, but we are either going to put this in the National Reporter or we will send the list out to the area directors for you to use. Now, on this list, approximately 
were new members or new handlers and new markets obtained in 1978. And probably on that list, about 50% of the volume came from this additional list of uh, handlers that were put on new in 1978. Now, I want to talk about beyond 1978 at the moment. There are certain key markets that the National Farmers Organization has to look at. These, number one, should be independent handlers, preferably those that are national organizations, because we're a national organization. It's easier for us to work with a national organization because they respect us as a national organization. By the key independents, I mean the Bordens, the Beatrices, I say Beatrice because I'm from Nebraska. It's supposed to be Beatrice, I guess. But they start in Nebraska, so I'm entitled to say Beatrice. Fairmont Foods, Foremost, Pet, Carnation, Universal Foods. And then some of the new national corporations that are getting into the business of using milk in special products. And this would include, for example, General uh, Mills, who have uh, gone into the Yoplait business, for example, and have one plant in Michigan, we're supplying milk to that, by the way, and are building two additional plants. We have to look at growth companies. Uh, Universal Foods is another company that we are supplying milk to, and they are a growth independent organization. Another category that's very important to us and we have to pay attention to are the grocery store chains, national chains that have what we call captive plants. These are large users of milk. They are very interested in working with the National Farmers Organization as suppliers of milk because they know very little about the obtaining and milk, doing field work, they prefer to work with someone that knows that business and we've earned their respect and have come to us. And by these chains, I mean the Kroger's, Safeway, Milgram Stores, Certified Grocers, this type of operation by grocery change, chains. Then we are not ignoring, of course, the strong area independents such as Cumberland Farms on the East Coast, Knutson, or one on the East and one on the West Coast, Wells Blue Bunny in the Midwest, Gorelick Farms in the East, the strong area independents. Good, solid handlers that respect quality, and we have worked our quality control program out, so we'll take second best to no one in the area of supplying quality product. And this is very important to these handlers. I'll, I'll make this very short because it looks like there's something else going to be going on. Um, they, re they recognize the National Farmers Organization for its strength that we have developed. And above all, we are non-competitive with them on the marketplace. Why should they be buying milk from a cooperative down the street? Maybe cutting price on them. This isn't good for the handler, handler or the farmer. And uh, uh, keep them in, uh, and when they could be dealing with National Farmers Organization that's non-competitive. Now, as far as volumes of future markets, and I'll finish with that, the volumes of future markets, I estimate roughly an existing markets that we now have that can be expanded and new markets that we can attain. And we've been told by handlers that they would buy milk from us. We need 800 million pounds per month more milk right now than we have that we're relying on you to come in and supply us with. Thank you, Eddie.
The, the guest speaker that we have here today, I'm going to say just a couple words about him. I understood that, I, I asked him, I said, well, do you have any farm background? And he said, no, but he says, I came from Massachusetts and I heard uh, Senator Kennedy say the other day that Massachusetts ranks number one in agriculture, they're the top in cranberries. So I said, well, you got that in your favor. Um, this gentleman uh, just told me, and it was very interesting to me because uh, a little bit of his background, I happened to find out that from 1933 to 1955, there were 10 people had the position that this man holds. And he's held this position from 1953 to 1978. So he must have something on the ball. I don't know if he's a Republican or a Democrat, but he's existed through several administrations from one to the other. So they must listen to him and he must know what he's doing. I'm proud to have this man here today. And I said, well, how did it happen you got into Washington? Well, he said, I wrote a, a paper one time or something on something I thought was wrong, price fixing in the dairy industry. People in Washington got a hold of that, read it and believed that he had something. He believed there was something wrong going on and he wanted to try and help change it. And I think uh, all through his life, from what I understand, if there's been something wrong, this gentleman has tried to change it, to make it right. Any time that anyone gets into his position, we have a tendency always to say, well, why doesn't he do something about it? I think all of us recognize that there are limits to what any individual can do and under certain circumstances, what he can do. I have to tell you, one of the first times I ever talked to this man, I, he doesn't know this yet, I, I'm sure, because I've told several people, I called him up for the director of the dairy division of the United States Department of Agriculture, and I said, uh, my name is Ed Graff, I'm the director of the Dairy Division of the National Farmers Organization in Corning, Iowa, and I got a problem. I really don't know how I got a problem in trying to market milk. Every time I get some farmers milk together and want to go and market it, the guy I talk to says, well, are you a qualified milk marketing association? And I said, uh, no, what do I have to do? Well, he says, you got to get qualified. So I called Mr. Forrest. I says, Mr. Forrest, how do I get qualified? He said, you got to sell some milk. <laughs> I said, I tried that, but they don't want to buy it. I'm not qualified. Well, he says, sell it and we'll qualify you. So he put me between what we call the rock and the hard place. But he, I never really told him that because he'd been of uh, great assistance to us. In all sincerity, I didn't know this man to work with him until after I knew a very close friend of his who told me that I would swear on his statement on a stack of Bibles that the man that holds that office is doing everything he can and has for many years for the American dairy farmer. And the thing that impressed me the most was he said, you never have to be concerned of this man's honesty. And that meant a lot in Washington, D.C., doesn't it? You betcha, and he's the kind of a man he is. So when I called and asked if he'd be a guest at our convention and speak to you. I was mighty happy when he said yes, which he confirmed in writing shortly after that. I've been kind of concerned who's taken care of him since he, he got here because I didn't see him till about 15 minutes ago myself, but I know he can take care of himself. 
He says, Ed, I'm not a powerful speaker. I said, I don't care about a powerful speaker today. I want you, as the man you are, to speak to our delegates. So it's very, I feel very proud today to introduce the director of the Dairy Division of the United States Department of Agriculture from Washington, D.C., Mr. Herb Forrest. Thank you. I feel very humble with that reception, but it uh, confirms my opinion of NFO members. I echo what Mr. McCarthy said to you. Your loyalty to your organization is the envy of many farm organizations in this country, and you should be proud of it. Ed, uh, I want you around when someone writes my obituary uh, because all I have to do is uh, paraphrase just what you said. Uh, it was a glowing <laughs> tribute. I wish I could live up to all those things. I uh, used to tell a funny story to start my talks, but I had a friend who was Secretary of Agriculture and he indicated he found out that was not the best recommendation to hold your job in Washington. <laughs> I had a young fellow come in the office the other day, and he uh, was a new employee, and he said, uh, how should I address you? Should I call you Mr. Forrest or the director? I said, well, young fellow, I don't much care which one of those terms you use. I said, some people call me stupid, but they're the ones who know me a little better. <laughs> I thought you might be interested in my outlook of what your price uh, might be in the next few months. Of course, we're all pretty pleased with the increases which have been taking place in the, in the dairy prices in the last several months. I guess you know that the MW price, which is the base of the order of prices, went up 26 cents a hundredweight in last month, which will be reflected in, in the price you receive months after it's happened, but I don't have much choice with respect to uh, that kind of a provision, which I will indicate a little bit later. <clears throat> that uh, 1044 is a pretty accurate reflection, I think, of what's taking place in, this, in the dairy industry in the last six months. We have had a production about equal or maybe a little bit less than what we had last year. And our sales have been pretty good. And as a result, there have been, as you know, particularly in Minnesota and Wisconsin and other parts of the country, there has been pressure from processors to get additional supplies of milk. And of course, that makes for a good, strong price. And I don't see anything in the picture this month to indicate that that price is going to slip off as it usually does in the month of December. And matter of fact, I think it might be equal to a little bit higher in the month of December. Come, uh, as you know, we also have a price support program. The price support program uh, price right now is nine dollars and sixty-four cents for three-five milk. That price must be adjusted on April one to reflect the increased cost of things which farmers buy. And the estimates now are that that price will increase from $9.64 to something a little over $10 on April 1. So you're looking at a price for the rest of the year in 1979, all the year 1979, 
of $10 or above for manufacturing grade milk as compared with, as I said, the price which was effective and is effective now of $9.64. Last year when the price was increased on April 1, everybody was fearful that we were going to uh, accumulate tremendous supplies of product and they would be jeopardizing the future sales of the industry and uh, also maybe even jeopardize the continuance of the support program. program. We were, people were estimating we would have as much as a billion pounds of powder in storage. Those things have not come to pass. We have no cheese in storage. We have only 150 to 200 million pounds of butter, which is not a great amount of butter and, and can be easily taken care of in the school lunch program and other relief programs. The powder is nowhere near what we had. We, we have in storage now only about 500 million pounds of, of powder. And with the rate at which we are being able to get rid of this powder in foreign outlets, we anticipate within another year we may be down to 350 million pounds of powder. So we're looking at a pretty strong market even on a commercial basis. But underlying it, as I indicated, we do have the support program and even if we would get some increases in production uh, next year, the support program will keep prices from getting under $10 a hundredweight for manufacturing milk. So all in all, it looks like a pretty good year for dairymen, and I would anticipate that we are going to ride above the $10 price as we did this year. Now, so much for the present situation. What I really would like to spend the rest of my time on is the program which I have spent, as Ed indicated, all my uh, career since 1935, and that is the milk order program. Milk order program, to me, uh, has the same objectives as organizations such as yours. That of creating an orderly marketing in this dairy industry so that farmers can get a decent price out of the product which they sell. We know with disorder, we know from history from disorder, uh, from uh, what, what happens when we have disorder in the market and who pays for it, and that's been the dairy farmer. And I think the order program has indicated that although we don't get the kind of prices which dairy farmers deserve, we do get the kind of pri much better prices than they would otherwise receive. The orders are not a full marketing program. They're only a tool for associations such as you to use. They don't do such things as they guaranteeing that anybody's going to take your milk. They don't, they don't guarantee that you're going to get a fixed price or a fixed income. All they do is assure you that you're going to get a price which reflects the true supply and demand conditions in the market. And one of the things that the federal orders do assure you uh, that when the Secretary of Agriculture fixes a price support for manufacturing grade milk, that you will get that increase, that same increase reflected as a minimum in the prices which you get for grade A milk in the Federal Milk Order Program. As I say, it's not a panacea for all the ills of the dairy farmer. Not a, very, very many times, the problems which the dairy farmer has uh, reflected to us as, why don't you do something under the milk program? Pa Congress did not give to the Secretary of Agriculture and to us running the milk program unlimited latitude to take care of all the ills of the dairy industry. We are fairly well limited in the kinds of things we can do in the federal milk order, and this was the specific intent of Congress and those who drafted the legislation. The legislation was first thought of, thought up, during the early 1930s. Originally, we had pretty broad uh, authority. Matter of fact, the original AAA Act said that the Secretary of Agriculture could create orderly marketing conditions by entering into marketing agreements and issuing licenses for any agricultural commodity. 
That was the sole direction which Congress gave us when we first started the audit program. Not long after that, the Supreme Court reviewed the legislation uh, in other acts and indicated that Congress could not delegate to the executive branch that kind of broad authority, and in any act which had that broad authority would fall as being unconstitutional. The farm leaders, recognizing that the licensing or order program for between 1933 and 1935 had tended to bring some order out of the chaos which was prevailing in the uh, milk markets, immediately went to work to draft legislation to correct this fault of, of, as they call it, undue delegation of authority from the legislative branch to the uh, executive branch. So they peculiarly, in our act, we have very specific uh, things which we can do and cannot do. In addition to that, the farm leaders who were drafting the legislation wanted to be sure that this did not become, this milk program did not become a program where we took over all the functions of the farm organizations. And so we have provisions in our act which says, you shall do one or more of these things and you shall not do certain other things. And what are some of those things? One, we can fix only minimum prices. We cannot fix the price. We can only fix minimum prices. That would leave some latitude for the farm organizations to negotiate prices above the minimums which are set. We must price this milk on a classified basis. We cannot fix a flat price for all milk. We must classify the milk according to the use. And we must provide for some kind of distribution of the amount of money coming from those minimum prices equitably and fairly among all the fa dairy farmers in the market. We can put an order in only with the approval of the dairy farmers. We, this is not a program which somebody from Washington says that group of farmers or that area needs to have an order. It must be put in and can only be put in with the approval of the majority of farmers in the area. And to make sure these farm leaders that we wouldn't get our nose in the tent and just stay there uh, and take over, they also provided that at the request of 50% of the dairy farmers in an area, the program must be terminated. The act also indicates that we cannot in our own minds concoct schemes in Washington as to how a certain market should be regulated. We must do it on the basis of evidence received at a public hearing where everybody has a shot at putting testimony in whether it's a proposal ought to be adopted or not. And we must base every provision on an order on evidence received at a public hearing where everybody can see what the evidence was, and we must spell out in our decision where we found the basis for each of our provisions in the hearing record. The Act says that we shall not fix resale prices. The Act says that we shall not discuss the proposals or the decisions, or recommended decisions, after the time we have issued a hearing notice with any interested party, that's to assure that we are not subject to information or advice or counsel outside the hearing record where other people cannot be privy to that information or counsel or advice. <clears throat> the Act also specifies that we shall set up an administrative agency to administer the order and that, that the expense of that agency will be paid for by the processes. Please turn the tape over to side number two.